American Cult Christianity, Part 22. Why are there so many strange American cults today? The assault on the gospel essential of justification by faith alone. Hello, this is Joe Franklin of SparrowMinistry.com. This is a continuation of my new YouTube series on American cults and their beginnings. This ongoing and vital series called American Cult Christianity asks the question, why are there so many strange American cults today? Again, the short answer is the assault on the gospel essential of justification by faith alone. This aspect of our salvation and foundational gospel truth is the number one target of the enemy and has been ever since the church began on the day of Pentecost. We've been talking about a number of non-Christian cults and cults of Christianity that were birthed during the Second Great Awakening and 19th century frontier America. All of these groups still infect the Christian church today with far too many Christians being unable to understand just what is it that makes these groups unorthodox. Well, let's find out. Disclaimer, this YouTube channel is dedicated to the study of controversial groups and movements, some that have been called uh, cults, sparrowministry.com. Okay, here we go, here we go, here we go. Reformation solas, the recovery of the gospel. And no, sorry, Campbellites, this is not the discovery of the, the gospel. This is not Alexander uh, Campbell's ancient gospel discovery. Uh, this is the recovery of the gospel after years and years and years of uh, legalism and traditionalism and works righteousness piped out by the Roman Catholic Church. Martin Luther and company had to correct their, or were given the grace of God to correct their theology. And we're uh, the beneficiaries of that. Thank you, God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Holy Ghost. So we've been into the uh, intro, part one of two, two of two. We've gone through grace alone, Christ alone, faith alone, God's glory alone. And now we're on scripture alone. It got a little bit large, so I've broken it up into two sec uh, uh, lessons, um, part one of two. This is part one of two, sola scriptura, the five solas of the Reformation. How exciting is this? So welcome to the heart and soul of this series on American cults and their beginnings. These five solas or descriptors of salvation are the key to understanding what saves and what does not save. They are also referred to as the guardrails of preaching. And I've broken uh, sola scriptura, like I said, into two parts for brevity, and this is part one of two. So why, uh, you know, why are the solas important? Well, in order to free yourself from the web of religious captivation piped out by the cults, they're real tricky, they're real clever, that's their works uh, salvation scheme, or to remain free and insulate yourself from being enslaved, two things must be done. You must first understand the simple common gospel. That's what you're looking at right here. Secondly, you need to be able to recognize that some of the key pillars of Campbellism or Adventism or whatever you're into, like the ICOC, some but not all, or the two by twos, maybe you're into the Cooneyites and all that. They're not only unbiblical in the cults, but they undermine and contradict the gospel. Now, if you understand these two things and embrace them, you will be free indeed. So here's a quote from the gospelcoalition.org on the five solas. The five solas are every bit as relevant in the 21st century as they were to the reformers. No, this is not a quote from that. I think I've uh, jettisoned that from my little uh, intro here. Anyhow, I don't have the quote from gospelcoalition.org on the five solas, but these uh, five solas were slogans, um, uh, and, and the reformers didn't know how important they would be. Uh, and we're, again, we're the, we're the beneficiaries of these uh, incredible teachings that came out of the Reformation. Anyhow, 
Here we go. The five solas, though, are every bit as relevant in the 21st century as they were to the reformers. And I want to make a little note on that so I can correct that before I get to uh, the next one. Sorry about that, guys. So they're, they're important. They're relevant. It's not ancient history. Uh, uh, discerning Christians should be familiar with these pillars as they came to us at great cost. Throughout church history, controversy has led to the clarification of orthodox doctrine. So controversy leads to clarification. For example, Martin Luther on October 31st, 1517 uh, AD, of course, posted his 95 theses on the door of the castle church in Wittenberg, Germany. This act of defiance helped begin the Reformation. Well, the Roman Catholic Church disagreed with Luther's uh, viewpoint naturally and excommunicated him. They responded to the Protestant movement by convening the Council of Trent. And this was their counter-reformation that took place in the middle of the 16th century. It lasted 15, 20 years, many, many meetings over quite a few years. Anyhow, finally, these solas should not be uh, described using the word solo. Uh, the Restoration Movement and Campbellites love to slur anyone who's not a part of their group. And uh, they'll use, oh, you believe in faith uh, uh, only. Okay, no. I <laughs> so anyhow, so Han Solo, Jabaka, and the Millennium Falcon are important to Star Wars and are not part of the Reformation time period. And again, they're going to accuse you and, and Protestants of believing that faith only saves or grace only saves solo fide or solo gratia, which is not true. Solo only is different than sola alone. Okay, and that's part of their thing. You know, they say the emptiest can rattles the loudest, and these rattlers are coming to a town near you. They know their theology is off, both on salvation and baptism, and so they're out. They're out to argue and disrupt, you know, like those dogs of legalism in Philippians 3, biting children, messing up the trash cans, causing chaos wherever they go. Those are the Campbellites. Campbellites and chaos. All right, so here we go, here we go, here we go. Okay, so here's part 21 review, and that's our happy sparrow up in the top left-hand corner. Sola, number four, God's glory alone. Walls breached, false man-centered gospel and salvation. That's what you get with Alexander Campbell and the restoration movement. That's the virus that he piped out into the stratosphere of American cult Christianity, 1800s. And then, of course, the other cults of restoration-ism were spun up, took a hold of those uh, false beliefs, and ran with them. And we're talking about a lot of cults now. So thank Alexander Campbell and company as associates for those set of false beliefs. All right, so here we go. False religion says in order. Now this is a review of uh, Sola number four, God's glory alone. So false religion says in order to be saved, works are a necessary condition of faith. And thus they confuse faith with works. And of course, they distort James 2.24. We can't forget that with the Campbellites, International Churches of Christ, Adventists, and every other cult that's out there. And the Roman Catholics love to roam, run to that one too. And this is the self-directed life. Okay, so this is the flesh talking. Okay, Campbellites and Adventists, next bullet, teach that only members of their one true church are Christians. Well, they have a franchise on salvation, apparently. Well, good luck if you're a Baptist, Presbyterian, Methodist, or Lutheran, because you're all going to hell. You're not a part of their church, and you don't agree with Alexander Campbell. <laughs> okay, all right, all right. So next bullet, prideful elitism, Pharisaism, uh, factions, holy huddles, works righteousness, all are man-centered and steal God's glory. This is also the Galatian heresy. So this is their work salvation. They're living a life of cursedness, estranged from Christ outside the realm of grace. If the spirit is uh, within them, the flesh is certainly in charge, don't you think? 
Okay, and that's Galatians 5 for the downward spiral of Galatianism. Trying to begin with the spirit, but then being perfected by the flesh. But as I've said many times before, if the way to come into the body of Christ is empty handed and it's by trusting in the grace, in Christ alone, grace alone, faith alone, well, then many of them are not even being born again. So these are unregenerate, unregenerate uh, folks running around practicing their little toxic faith. Anyhow, next bullet, the outworking of this fleshly system and do-it-yourself uh, gospel always results in boasting and spiritual snobbery. Oh, when I drink me tea, me fingers raised in the air. <laughs> okay. All right. Church of Christ co-founder Alexander Campbell there over there in the the moss green said, faith indeed is the grand medium through which forgiveness is accessible. Aye, but something more is necessary, me bucko. <coughs> oh, boy. Old Israel failed to understand faith righteousness, too, folks. They should learn from Israel. Romans 10, verses 1 through 13. So, and don't forget the heresy of baptismal regeneration. So some comments here on this review of last week's Sola number four, God's glory alone. You know, so if your version, and this is what I want to say, if your version of Christianity isn't leading to ever increasing levels of freedom and assurance and walking by the spirit, then you're doing it wrong. Legalism and exclusivism don't make you want to try harder. It only makes you want to give up. You either pepped up or pooped out. And you're deceived every point in between, by the way. So I've made use of the term cult and cultist quite a bit in this YouTube series for a good reason. The word cultist means that they view themselves and their earthly visible organization as being synonymous with the body of Christ and that nobody is a Christian if they do not belong to their group. Their cult mythology has them believing that Alexander Campbell restored the true apostolic church and the church of Christ, disciples of Christ and Christian church are it. Now, of course, this became the genesis <laughs> for the Mormons, Christadelphians, Jehovah's Witnesses, and the United uh, Pentecostals, who all, by the way, claim that they are the only true nest to, they are the only true nest New Testament church in our day, to the exclusion of all others. So they're all pointing fingers at each other and all arguing and fighting now. All right, the dogs are loose. The trash, you take out the trash. You know they're just disturbing, disrupting everything, turning on each other, biting the children, children of God. Bottom line, the restoration movement is the spawning ground for all the major cults that afflict the Christian church today. These are false churches and false religions in that they deny justification by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, according to the authority of Scripture. Now, you've got four of the five solas being rejected by the cults that I just referenced in one simple, understandable sentence just now. Four of the five, folks. When one falls, they all fall, the solas. But anyhow, because they reject essential Christian doctrines, you should leave these churches and head for the exit doors immediately. Go with grace, folks, and keep away from the cults of Christianity. Okay, so this is a good one. You've seen it before. Um, I put a little lime green, some lime green boxes on it, and just fidgets, you know, made a few tweaks. So anyhow, unbiblical theology and hermeneutics. So let's get back to sola number five, sola scriptura. Unbiblical theology and hermeneutic give birth to errors in doctrine and belief. And there's the little star. Once the false teaching goes down into the soil, it's difficult to uproot, right? You can't put the toothpaste back, back in the bottle. <laughs> so anyhow, so we've got two trees. We've got the healthy one on the right, the unhealthy one on the left. Above the two trees, you've got a rounded lime green box with a light bulb. Biblical hermeneutical, biblical hermeneutic approach. Scripture should in interpret scripture. It also states that we should interpret confusing or complex passages 
based on clear passages. Okay, Acts 2.38 and Acts 22.16 are difficult to exegete. You need to look to other scriptures, such as the Gospel of John, and such as Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, the gospel of, uh, in a nutshell, and all the many references to grace and the prohibition against works in terms of salvation. Look at those passages to help you understand the difficult ones. That's what I'm saying here. The Bible must be interpreted in such a way that it is not contradictory. We're gonna, <laughs> I'm going to put some real contradictions in front of you today. And if you're familiar with the Restoration Movement, Churches of Christ, International Church of Christ, or Adventists, you know about those contradictions. Anyhow, if the Bible is contradictory, then it can't be God's word. Let's deal with the healthy tree on the right. That's this biblical belief and biblical practice. Okay, that's where you want to be. Orthodox hermeneutics, understanding the Bible, uh, the meaning of Bible text. Okay, that's what you want. You want, and that leads to a biblical understanding of theology and correct understanding of basic Christian doctrine. Okay, one of those most basic doctrines is that God appropriates salvation by faith alone. Also, you should understand the theological eras, especially the Reformation. You know a little bit about Augustine and that era too. Okay, so, uh, but, oh my gosh, Pharisaism, Galatian heresy, ah, this must be the Restoration Movement and uh, the Campbellites, okay? Unorthodox hermeneutics, understanding the meaning of Bible texts. Okay, well, they, they looked at legalistic patternism. Well, good luck with that one. Poor understanding of theology, getting it wrong, confusing grace with works and, and all different other kinds of stuff, right? False definitions, confusion upon confusion, and just generally a superficial understanding of basic Christian doctrine. Of course, they reject the fact that God appropriates salvation by faith alone. They're going to reject that and fight it. Sins of the flesh are at root with this uh, ugly tree. The root issue, and here's the thing, the root issue with problematic church teachings, Campbell and company in their misinterpretation of Acts 2.38 and Acts 22.16, 1 Peter 3.21 and others, uh, James uh, 2.24, uh, and just go on and on. The root issue always comes back to hermeneutics, applied rules of Bible interpretation, and they went with scientific reasoning and Scottish Enlightenment, CEI, the lie of CEI. They go with command, example, and necessary inference. Even their own leaders, many of them, say, hey, we got to come up with something new because, man, this ain't working. Anyhow, if the lens by which one views the Holy Scriptures is askew, then how great the resulting error? Well, you're going to have poor understanding, superficial understanding, looking through the lens of legalistic patternism. And scientific reasoning. So some comments. Church of Christ methodology for understanding the Bible. We just talked about it. Extremely problematic and unreliable. This is a foundational issue for the group and continues to this very day. No other group recognizes CEI as being orthodox or effective. Think about that for a minute. Put that in your pipe and smoke it. Huh? The hermeneutical lie of CEI. Embraced and promoted by Alexander Campbell and his associates has, associates has birthed many problems for the Restoration Movement. Legalistic patternism next to the Church of Christ heresy on baptismal regeneration and the denial of justification by grace alone through faith alone in Christ alone is the biggest driver of their false church and cultic religion. The Church of Christ claims to go by the Bible only, yet they contradict clear Bible teachings with their quirky, idiosyncratic, and cultic views. Now, they, now again, we're talking about the hardliners, not instrumental. Legalistic patternists, okay, that's what we're talking about. Not all of the churches of Christ, folks. Not all of the Christian churches or the disciples of Christ. Not all of the Seventh-day Adventists. Pretty much all of the ICOC. They haven't moved off their mark one, one iota, actually. But anyhow, so they proudly claim the following. This is the Restoration Movement Churches of Christ, okay? They claim, one, to speak where the Bible speaks and remain silent where the Bible is silent. Okay, that's their little motto. Two, they call Bible things by Bible names. 
Man, other churches don't. Three, book, chapter, and verse is, a, is their standard of truth. Show me the book, chapter, and verse. Okay, well. Four, for all other inconsistencies, I want to just tell the viewers, uh, uh, for the, it, uh, you know, please see Bob Ross's book on the next slide is all I can tell you. Uh, so, and you'll see that very clearly. I'll talk about it. So anyhow, apoc apoc ah, hypocrisy is saying one thing and doing the other. So let's, I'm going to, I'm going to camp out on this for a little bit. Campbellites complain about the speck in someone else's eye when they have a big old log in their own. I was the same too when I was in the international churches of Christ. A little Pharisee. Jesus warns us about the false prophets in his Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 7, 15. He said we would know them by their fruit. Well, look at the tree. Not seeing a whole lot of fruit there. The Church of Christ has no book, chapter, and verse for contacting the blood or touching the blood of Christ in the waters of baptism. We go on and on. Yeah, we contact the blood in baptism. God's scrubbing away sins and all this kind of stuff. Well, it sounds great, but where is it? Well, there's no book, chapter, and verse on that. The Church of Christ accuses other Christian groups of having been started by mere men when history and their own literature clearly shows that the Church of Christ was started by mere men. Thomas and Alexander Campbell on May 4th, 1811. Well, there's no, let's continue on. I'm not done, folks. There's no book, chapter, or verse, nor is there a single solitary sentence anywhere in all the Bible that even hints of God's disapproval of instrumental music. Yeah. <laughs> the Church of Christ condemns denominationalism, yet Webster gives three definitions of a denomination, and wouldn't you know it, the Church of Christ meets every single one of them. Okay. <laughs> oh, boy. So Bob L. Ross, his book, Campbellism, It's History and His Heresies. That's what I'm asking you to look at. Go ahead and purchase Pilgrim's publication, and it's probably on Amazon. Anyhow, his book, Histories and Heresies, will point out how these claims of the Church of Christ do not match their historical writings, doctrines, and beliefs. He's a historian. He's an expert. The book, chapter, and verse and calling Bible things by Bible names viewpoint has led to a number of serious problems for the group and explains why they are lost in a maze of doctrinal issues. Dr. Robert Moray, another expert on the restoration movement, cites research data that fingers these two mantras or claims to fame as the underlying reason for the restoration move movement splitting into a myriad of sects. There are approximately, hold on to your, your, you know, hold on here, because I'm going to tell you something here on this one. Brace yourself. There are approximately 110 issues that have split the movement over the years from pitch pipes, pitch pipes to missionary societies to choirs. Book, chapter, and verse have led to absurd and biblical unsupported theology. Currently, the Stone Campbell Scott Churches of Christ and the Restoration Movement have further divided into over two dozen factions since the time the co-founder, Alexander Campbell, supposedly restored their church in 1811. Over two dozen, folks. You'll know them by their fruit, says Jesus. Coming mainly from the ultra-conservative segment of the Restoration Movement, the curse of legalism, sectarianism, exclusivism, and isolationism have crippled their false religion. All cults refuse to have the scripture as their highest authority and have made many non-essentials essential. Church of Christ, Church of Christ cringe when you talk about their founders. Well, you know, what, what should one think of the fact that none, listen to this, none of the four, four primary founders of the Restoration Movement, none of them, Thomas Campbell, son, Alexander Campbell, their evangelist, Walter Scott, nor Barton Stone, the anti-Trinitarian, none of them were ever baptized for the remission of sins. 
<laughs> Why didn't Stone, Campbell, or Scott ever obey the ancient gospel, which was restored by Walter Scott, 1827? Well, that's right, folks. The founders restored the Church of Christ, but were never baptized for the remission of sins. There are simply too many errors of the children of Alexander Campbell to mention here. We'd be here all day and all night. You'd have to get out your sleeping bag. I'll put uh, some links down in the video description for the lesson. You're welcome to per peruse them yourself. So I'll link up to some articles and stuff. Okay. So the restoration movement hides behind book, chapter, and verse, even as they insist that we are saved only by grace and then go on to explain that our obedience is required to earn God's grace. Huh? We have covered that scam extensively. Even their five-step plan of salvation calls for the work of baptism as a prerequisite to obtaining salvation. Well, isn't this construct a tradition of man and not the command of God? Isn't this salvation by works because it requires one to obey in order to be saved? Baptism is a work, and salvation is by grace through faith, Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, and many others. When works are in view regarding obtaining salvation, the Bible makes clear it is the work of Christ, John chapter 6, verses 28 and 29. Salvation is 100% by Christ's work and not a none of ours. 100%. And this is what makes authentic Christianity so unique. Again, the Church of Christ teaching of baptismal regeneration, a term used by Alexander himself, by the way, to describe his theory on baptism and thus salvation, is very pro problematic in that it teaches a regeneration by faith and works. Well, this is a contradiction to the Gospel of John, which proclaims faith as the sole prerequisite to receiving eternal life. John has nearly 100 references to believe or belief as the sole means of salvation. The Gospel writer actually tells us that his Gospel was written to tell us how to be saved through placing our faith in the person of Christ. John 20, 21, but these are written that you may believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and that by believing you may have life in his name and no references using the word baptism for salvation or anything similar. Okay, restoration movement theology on justification, moving on, is also confused and contradictory. Doesn't the law of non-contradiction, this is the unity of scripture where, where one passage cannot contradict another, doesn't the law of contradiction, which logically says that two distinctly different or opposite things cannot be true at the same time in the same sense? Well, the restoration movement proudly state that one is saved by a free gift from God's grace, right? And that it is unmerited only to turn around in the same breath that the gift requires some effort on our part, huh? That we are saved by our works after all. <laughs> Sheesh, okay. This is the same view of grace held by the Church of Christ, Seventh-day Adventists, Jehovah's Witnesses, and the Mormons, who were all birthed in the 1800s along with Alexander Campbell and the Churches of Christ. And you can add the Roman Catholic Church and about a dozen other cults to that uh, uh, sentence there, that paragraph I just gave you on justification. Basically, justification through, uh, by works. That's all it is. But the cultists can't help themselves. Okay, really worked up now and says, hey, uh, the Church of Christ only speaks where the Bible speaks, and we remain silent where the Bible is silent. Okay, well, isn't the Bible silent on many things which churches of Christ do or practice? Well, case in point, church buildings, placing membership, five-point plan of salvation, shaped notes, four-part harmony, audio and visual equipment, and on and on and on. 
Oh boy. The restoration movement refused to understand the relationship between salvation and work. So moving on from this hypocrisy and their, their heresy on justification through works, Let's talk about this. The Roman, uh, the, the Restoration Movement refused to understand the relationship between salvation and works and faith and works. Like the Roman Catholic Church, their go-to text that they keep coming back to is James 2.24, as they argue that salvation is through works. The question the half-brother of Jesus posed in James 2.14 is answered by James and has been embraced by most theologians throughout the centuries. We are justified by faith alone with works being the inevitable result of a transformed life. Works describe a justifying faith or saving faith, but do not save unto themselves, period. Well, the cults employ this crafty spin on James 2 in order to bolster their false gospel and make it seem palatable and reasonable. Again, that empty can rattles the loudest. These are rattlers. And they're word salad games. They're shell game. Anyhow, bottom line, their motto is this. Look, where the Bible speaks, we speak. Where the Bible is silent, we are silent. But don't they break that rule all the time? Again, for all other inconsistencies and Bible contradictions in the Church of Christ, please see Bob Ross's book on the next slide. Okay, so moving on to the next slide. That was really important. Okay, so there's Bob Ross's book there on uh, lower at the bottom there, kind of in the middle off to the right, Bob L. Ross, Campbellism, Its History and Heresies. You want to learn about the... Um, the Adventist, uh, the Cult of Christianity, Seventh-day Adventist, uh, read Walter Ray's The White Lie. If you want to know everything about the International Churches of Christ, their false, false man-centered gospel and theology, and their erroneous disciple doctrine, read my book, Taken Captive, the 2019 International Church of Christ Report, out on Kindle. So there we have our heretics on the left, who is right, the founder of your church or the apostles, okay? And on the right, remember this one? This was a part 16 slide, the intro to the soul is part one of two. I put it on here, it's just so important. All restoration movement and restorationism cults claim two sources of truth. Well, the Bible, well, you should if you're claiming to be a Christian group, but two the inspired writings of their founders <laughs> and other prophecies and discoveries. And of course, they'll strongly deny this. Get all worked up. Start rattling that can, boy. It's going to be kicking it down the road and they're going to come after you. And they'll say otherwise, but it's simply not true. <coughs> Fact, their writings are put on the same level as scriptural truth and continue as an authoritative source of truth within the sect. Fact. Some of these doctrines are contrary to the gospel. Okay. Moving. Okay, so this is some good stuff. Here's another Bob Ross book. I've got both of them. Mm. Excuse me. <clears throat> the Restoration Movement. I love the graphics and the artwork by Bob L. Ross. Not the painter, Bob Ross. Anyhow, and there's the Rattler, different Rattler this time, and notice the tail, and I'll explain those letters in a minute, but uh, this is a keeper. This is what he went into debates, de debates with. Uh, this were her is uh, debate prep notes, uh, typed up and organized. It's really good if you want a, just a quick cliff notes on how to refute uh, restorationism, the restoration movement, this is it right here. And short and sweet, he just gets right down to it. Excellent theologian, scholar, historian, man of God, truly, truly spirit, uh, walks in the spirit, Bob Ross. So anyhow, and if you want to grow and grow quickly, you know, I just think of those miracle grow plant food commercials, you know, then here's the thing. Start reading material outside your church tradition. I know that it's considered apostate reading anything outside of the restoration movement. If you're Church of Christ or International Church of Christ or a one cupper or whatever, whatever little offshoot, even the uh, disciples of Christ in the Christian church. Oh, that's apostate. Okay, well, 
I don't think so. But notice that the letters on the Rattler's tail are the first letters of the Restoration Movement supposed five-point plan of salvation. Hear, believe, repent, confess, and be baptized. So that's the HBRCB. Uh, so I, I like the artwork on that one. That's a good one. Anyhow, you can get his book on Pilgrim's Publication. I'm not sure if it's on Amazon. You might have to go to Pilgrim's Publication. I think that's the teaching ministry of R.C. Sproul, I believe. Okay, so inside the book, it says the restoration plea examine. We just talked about the plea. They, all those, they got all these mottos and pleas. You know, Thomas Campbell, where the, where the scriptures speak, well, we speak. And where the scriptures are silent, well, we are silent. He thought he could, this is from his memoirs, by the way, volume one, page 236. Again, Bob Ross is a historian. He uses their own words to refute their own uh, false man-centered gospel and salvation. So here it is on the left. So this is what the restoration movement said. I thought they could unite everyone. If we just all agree with scientific viewpoint on how to read the Bible, and of course, if you'd all agree with Alexander Campbell, everyone would be united and would come over the uh, Campbellites and be baptized for the remission of sins. Okay. <laughs> all right. How'd that work out? Okay. So number one, are the scriptures infallible? Well, yeah. Two, are the scriptures free of error? Well, yeah. Again, if interpreted correctly, are the other scriptures complete with truth? Yeah, everything we need for life and godliness. Um, are, are the scriptures perfect? Well, they are, but again, uh, we have a difficult time uh, understanding them because they were written in a different language in a different time. So Campbell said, well, geez, then everything on the right, you know, everything on the left is true. Then guess what? The restoration, restorationists claim the same and move over Pope of Rome. So you see what's happening? So let me explain this for a minute. The restoration movement and Alexander Campbell are indistinguishable in terms of ideas and influence. So the restoration movement is Alexander Campbell and vice versa. Church of Christ remnant theology makes them the one true church of the New Testament, which means they cannot have any perfections. <sighs> the true apostolic church in our day can't be wrong on anything, can it? Well, here we see just how ridiculous their plea really is, this motto of theirs, as they claim that since the scripture is perfect, well, they are too, since they alone are the Lord's church. And you better not disagree with Alexander Campbell and his views on anything, because if you do, you are doomed to hell, as he not only restored the church in 1811, but discovered the ancient gospel and five-point plan of salvation in 1823. <laughs> Whoa, <laughs> okay. All right, saved by perfect obedience, saved by perfect interpretation, and you've split over two dozen times and you've got 110 other little ideas and issues that have split you apart and fractured your church and okay uh, this isn't working folks all right here's another one from his book it says what man's works uh this is another one Wh what man's works can and cannot do works cannot on the left save but works can on the right manifest salvation and a number one there, uh, it's a James 2 kind of thing. Once you understand that works don't save us or keep us saved, they're more appropriate for rewards. You understand, James. And once you understand uh, that works are the inevitable result of a transformed life, uh, then you begin to understand some of this. Um, so here's a little bit of doctrine. We're going to go on from these silly mottos of theirs and their claim to fame, which they just trip all over themselves trying to uphold. So anyhow, here Ross points out a number of restoration movement doctrinal errors and inconsistencies. And I put a check in front of those doctrines, the restoration movement and restorationism cults violate. If you're a disciple of the International Church of Christ, this would apply to you as well. Okay, last one from Ross's book. Let's see, which one is this? Book, chapter, and verse for the restoration movement. Here's all their rules. You know, this is book, chapter, and verse. So they got to follow these rules themselves because they're legalistic patternists. 
Okay, so uh, let's see, where are we on the on the notes? Now, this is interesting. Number one, name. Now, this is funny. Notice there's no scripture given on any of this because they don't have. There is nothing in the Bible, book, chapter, and verse, for the claims, these rules that the Church of Christ say they hold to. Well, we're the restoration mo movement, number one. Well, where's the scripture on that? Two, restorationists. Always talking about them. Hey, the restoration. Nothing in the Bible. Three, their plea. Man, <coughs> restore New Testament Christianity. You notice how the Bible never talks about restoring something that only the Holy Spirit could do in the age of fulfillment once the day of Pentecost started and beyond. That was an act of God. What does it say in the Bible that we need to restore New Testament Christianity? We certainly need to love God and follow the Bible, don't we? But where does it say that? There is no book, chapter, and verse, folks. Four, Constitution, Declaration, and Dress. They got all these things. Rule, we speak where the Bible speaks. Yeah, well, we already disproved that. So, you know, it, Thomas Campbell is, a, is the father. Alexander Campbell is the head of the church and all this kind of stuff. None of this is in the Bible. Brush Run, its origin, the church. The church's origin began in Brush Run, Pennsylvania in 1811. Where's the scripture? Ancient gospel. First practice in 1827. That's Walter Scott. He started preaching this nonsense and it actually caught on. People thought salvation was a series of steps. Well, where's that in the Bible? Where's the, the, the book, chapter, and verse for that? It's nowhere in the Bible. <laughs> salvation is not a series of steps in the Bible. Okay, so it's claim restoration movement equal church. Well, that's not there either. Sorry. Again, book, chapter, and verse have made absolute hypocrites out of the restoration movement and their offspring. Okay, so here's a good summary of the stuff that we've talked about thus far in this particular uh, part, part 22. Summary of cultists and their errors, restorationism and their set of beliefs. So they've crossed the line. They dismiss, marginalize, marginalize and ignore the theological eras. Again, all of them, Reformation, Augustine, all that stuff, they ignore them all. Lessons learned about original sin, they throw that out. Pelagianism, hey, that's their man. They're semi-Pelagian or full Pelagian, actually, right? Uh, the, the Trinity, well, Alexander Campbell wouldn't use the word. He, he preferred the Godhead. And uh, Barton Stone, cold and dead as a stone, well, he was anti-Trinitarian. But one thing for sure they reject, all the cults, is salvation by faith alone. And that's non-negotiable, folks. That puts you into the realm of the cults. You cross the line, especially when all of these groups claim that no one else is a Christian if they don't follow all the rules that they do. That's what makes you a cult. Dangerous, destructive, divisive. Stay away from these cults, okay? These are apostate groups. Okay, next uh, here we see a Bible. They refuse to correctly handle God's word by holding to a sound approach to understanding scripture. That was our tree, the fruit, fruitful tree and the scrubby tree, okay? They violate key principles of sound literary interpretation. The lie of CEI, command example, a necessary inference, legalistic, patternistic view of the Bible, okay? They insert their own beliefs into the text, ignoring context and author intent, semantics, biblical term, some, uh, uh, ignoring, uh, ignoring context and author intent and semantics. Biblical terms are used, but given a different meaning rose-colored glasses. And I, told you, I tell you, the word salad in the shell game, they distort works, they distort grace, they distort faith. They are major distorters in the restoration movement. All the cults. Contradictions abound. The unity of scripture gets appended and contradictions abound. Scripture is supposed to interpret scripture, not in the cults. There are so many contradictions. People are coming out of this group more confused than ever. Okay, 
So the influence of Campbell, this is a, a good uh, comment from Russell Padden, and this is from the Churches of Christ to the Boston Movement, a comparative study. This was his uh, doctoral or his master's thesis he did in 1992 in the University of Kansas. It's re uh, retrieved from reveal.org, and that's a website that will teach you about uh, the Church of Christ and the International Church of Christ run by none other than Chris Lee graduate of Cornwell uh, Theological Seminary and a really great um, family man and Bible student, Chris Lee, reveal.org. So here's the quote from Mr. Padden, quote on Campbell. This is the influence of Campbell. Quote, Campbell was certainly a product of his time, although he claimed to have endeavored to read the scriptures as though no one had ever read them before me, and was against being influenced by any foreign name, authority, or system, whatever, he still read the Bible as a grandchild of the Puritans, a child of European and American enlightenment, and an ardent disciple of John Locke and the Scottish common sense philosophers who adopted Locke's thought." End of quote. Campbell had massive blind spots, folks. He also threw out the creeds, the heroes of the faith, and scholars that preceded him, and he sought to understand the scriptures with a just me and my Bible approach. Okay, don't, don't bother him. Whoa, pride goes before the fall, folks. Again, look at the fruit. Okay, so this is a good one. I think I've used this sometime in the past, not really sure. But saved by works and baptism, all the cults have this uh, as their theological emphasis, saved by works and baptism, delusions to the faith, and there we have the water. Indoctrination manuals, there they are. You must adopt everything the organization says in order to be saved. Now, we've got two different kinds of apostate groups. Those in the orange, they reject the Godhead or the Trinity. Well, those came out at the same time as Alexander Campbell and Company in the 1800s. That's Jehovah's Witnesses and the Watchtower Publication. It's their little propaganda arm. Then you got the LDS and the Book of Mormons also came out. Many of the Mormons were leaders within the Church of Christ and friends of Alexander Campbell. Joseph Smith stole Alexander Campbell's plan of salvation on baptism, <laughs> seeing an interrelatedness and interconnectedness with the restoration movement and the false set of beliefs that were spun up by Campbell and his associate, associates. I hope you're seeing this. Now, the blue ones are the cults of Christianity. They reject the Christian gospel. Justification by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone, apart from works of any kind. The works come after that justification event. But even then, they don't save you or keep you saved. They're more appropriate for rewards. We just went over that. Check your Bob Ross book. Check your commentary. You'll find it's true. So the cults of Christianity, Church of Christ. That's the Jules Miller film strip series. There's six of those little pamphlets. You can also get the film strips. It's just Church of Christ propaganda. That's all it is convincing you that they're the true church and no one else is, filling your head full of all kinds of subtle heresies and a false man-centered gospel and salvation. The group that I was a part of, the International Church of Christ, that's their little Making Disciples uh, booklet, Kip McKean, Develop First Principles, that's another one, um, super, super subtle uh, heresy, but they're, they're like the Church of Christ on steroids, man. They're even more legalistic and heretical than the Church of Christ, if you can believe that. Whew. And here we have, you know, the Seventh-day Adventists. You know, you had William Miller, the Millerites, and then, of course, later Ellen G. White. Amazing facts you'll see on uh, TV. That's the Seventh-day Adventists, and they got all kinds of propaganda material out there. <coughs> Excuse me. Some comments. So here are some other churches coming out of Restorationism who share some of the same unbiblical beliefs piped out by the Stone Campbell Scott Churches of Christ. You got the Disciples of Christ, Churches of Christ, the Christian Church, Mormonism, Jehovah's Witnesses, the Millerites, later to be the Seventh-day Adventists, and Ellen G. White, and then you got the Christadelphians, then you got the International Church of Christ, the group that I was a part of way late, way after that time, began in 1979. 
In terms of their unbiblical baptism theology, paraphrasing Dr. Robert Moray, it's the same theology that you will find in the Mormon Church, the United Pentecostals, and at least a dozen other cultic groups. <laughs> the YouTube series I'm referring to is, in, uh, is entitled, this is uh, Dr. Moray's Church of Christ and Baptism. Just look up Dr. Robert Moray and hit his series on Church of Christ and Baptism. I'll put a link in the description of the video. Moray continues, paraphrasing here, according to Nathaniel West, this is a prominent Church of Christ historian. Many of the early Mormon leaders were first part of Alexander Campbell's Church of Christ and personal friends of Alexander Campbell. <laughs> That's right. Sidney, Sidney Rigdon, Polly Pratt, Oliver Crowdy, Orson Hyde, <coughs> Layman White, Edward Partridge, John Carell, Isaac Morley, and John Murdoch. These were all significant leaders in the early Mormon movement who taught Joseph Smith's theology. They were all past members or pastors in the Church of Christ movement started by Alexander Campbell. Folks, you can't make this stuff up. Birds of a feather flock together is the adage here. We wouldn't have the plague of the Mormons if it were not for Alexander Campbell and the Restoration Movement. We wouldn't have the plague of the Jehovah's Witnesses if it were not for Alexander Campbell and the Restoration Movement. And there are many, many more. Campbellism is also connected to Christadelphianism, a fancy uh, way of saying basically the Brothers of Christ. And I believe the Mormon Church, when they first start, started out, they, they picked up on Campbell's, hey, you got to call Bible things by Bible names. And I think the Mormons first called themselves the Church of Christ, and they later added the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. You see that? So look, uh, most of these cults, teach you must be baptized in order to obtain remission of sins. They all teach heretical new birth water baptism, aka baptismal regeneration. The cults teach that baptism is a necessary component of salvation, not a response to salvation. Folks, it's a component. Oh gosh, that's a serious heresy, easily disproved. The Pentecostals came out and this is the Pentecostals here. They came out of the Azusa Street Revival in California around 1905. And that's why I haven't really covered them. They're not a uh, 19th century cult of Christianity. They're a 20th, 20th century. Anyhow, Pentecostals, these groups would simply uh, be not running around today if it were not for guess who? Alexander Campbell, his co-founders, and the concepts and ideas they espoused and taught. It's that simple, folks. The UPCI, United Pentecostal Church International, their official website has the following belief statement on baptism. Quote, calls it a sacrament. And by the way, that's what the Church of Christ and the ICOC consider baptism. It's both a sacrament and an, ordin an ordinance. So anyhow, so this is what they say, UPCI. UPCI sacraments on baptism. Quote, the United Pentecostal Church requires water baptism as a condition for salvation. And the formula is in the name of Jesus, not in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, as other Protestants denomination observe. Baptism is by immersion only, ruling out pouring, sprinkling, and infant baptism. Again, it's a condition for salvation. Stunning, a stunning heretical teaching. Anyhow, so this is the deadly heresy of conditionalism, which is the work salvation scheme of the 19th century cults of Christianity. And of course, UPCI came online in the 20th century. This is the subtle heresy of Christian justification through works. This is a false gospel. This is apostasy. This series has put a much needed spotlight on the restoration movement for good reason. The restoration movement provided the fertile spawning ground for the major cults that afflict the church of Jesus Christ today. These groups are parasites and antagonistic towards God's blood-bought children and anyone who does not think the way they do. Again, like legalistic and ravenous dogs that go around biting children 
disrupting households, knocking over the trash. Jesus said you'll know them by the fruit. Obviously, not everyone within these groups thinks that way. Again, Church of Christ don't want to hear about the founding fathers of their, uh, of their restored church for good reason. There's a good reason they don't want to talk about their history. According to their own doctrine on baptism, this, this is unbelievable. If true, then the original founders of the restoration movement were never saved themselves. This is according to their own doctrine on baptism. They were never baptized unto the remission of sins as the Campbellite doctrine demands. They were all lost and dead in their sins. The only baptism they had was infant baptism as Presbyterians and then later at the hands of a Baptist clergyman. That's a fact, folks. That's in the memoirs and the history books. They were never rebaptized and are thusly unregenerate and unsaved men. Yet these men were the restorers of the gospel? They also restored the church in 1811. God used condemn men, unregenerate, lost in their sins, children of the devil, to restore the church after some 1,800 years of dormancy? Good night. I hope you don't believe that malarkey. That's ridiculous. Okay, Church of Christ Book Publishing. Be on the lookout for this stuff. This is their uh, spiritual pornography, so to speak, their propaganda, promoting a spirit of exclusivism, arrogance, and error. error. Okay, the first one, this is just screen captures from my cell phone. This is 21st, it's really hard to see that. I think 21st Century Christian, Standard Publication, Publishing, CEI, there's Command, Example, Necessary, Inference, Bookstore. There's the lie of CEI. So if you want to read a bunch of legalistic, patternistic stuff, go to the Gospel Advocate. Um, next one, College Press. And the next one is Fourth Right Press or something. Yeah. Okay. Um, so there's the stuff. Stay away from it. Protect your children. Help your friends if they're willing to listen. And I'm not saying that every book being sold by these restoration movement publishers is, is an error or that they all convey a sinful elitist viewpoint. Don't expect these publishers to jettison 200 years of holding to a false man-centered gospel and salvation to be the ones to lead you to the promised land. These are sectarian publishers and hold to doctrines that are outside orthodoxy. Use some common sense. Stop reading Church of Christ material if you want to understand the gospel and free yourself from years of indoctrination and legalistic patternism, false definitions, subtle lies, you name it. On a more positive note, Max Lucado has roots in the restoration movement, and I would recommend his scholarly work. I've got uh, some of his desk calendars. Wonderful, inspirational, grace uh, preacher. Rubel Shelley seems orthodox as well. I don't know much as much about him. Move okay, so here's some cult, uh, cult teachers here, a false teacher on the left. Uh, this is the Seventh-day Adventist guy, Amazing Facts with Doug Batchelor. Very well spoken, um, and uh, he's on the TV. On the right, uh, Disciples Today. Uh, thankfully, the International Church of Christ doesn't have a TV show, but this is their cultic uh, main uh, repository for all their information and their cult material and propaganda. Disciples Today. Okay, that's the International Church of Christ, heavily monitored, and of course, <laughs> so is their uh, ICOC Facebook page. Anytime somebody even says anything truthful about the groups there's you know they the comment is pulled off so they monitor uh, that website heavily 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 um, cultic methodology moral deception aggressive proselytizing and scripture twisting these people don't share the gospel because they don't believe in the gospel they proselytize they recruit Okay, and uh, so a little uh, helpful scriptures, Colossians 2.10 at the bottom there in the blue rounded uh, box there. Uh, Colossians 2.10, Jesus is all we need. And 1 Peter 1.3, his word has given us everything we need for life and godliness. So why do we look to these religious charlatans? Again, cults appeal to us through our pride. This is why we do it. 
They appeal to our pride and take advantage of our ignorance and superstitious nature. They appeal to our religious flesh, that part of us that wants to be God. Remember that war between the flesh and the Holy Spirit? Cults exploit the ignorant and offer them a shortcut to faith. They offer up legalism that supplements Christ, and they wrap their poisonous doctrines in lots of religious packaging. Like I said, that word salad. Unfortunately, far too many, including myself at one time actually, have looked to men and their novel teachings instead of embracing grace and the Christian gospel and the five souls of the Reformation. And perhaps we're drawn to confident men who seem to have all the answers, right? These clouds without rain, they look so bold. They look like they're going to give life. They look like they're going to water our crops. They go by looking authoritative. They pass and not one drop of nourishing, life-giving, living water. Dead shells, dead men with their dead message. Okay, let's see if we can't move along here. Okay, theology definitions assignment. Remember we had that assignment from theology definitions. This is our Daily Bread University. I thought I'd put it up there. Let's talk about something positive. Instead of cult propaganda, churches of Christ and all this kind of stuff, our Daily Bread. I read this every morning. Not every morning. <laughs> I'm, I'm inconsistent. I'll be honest with you. I read a lot of different things and I ebb and flow throughout the day. But this is good, our Daily Bread. There's the um, link. It's uh, You'll have to write that down and just queue it up yourself. This was one of the assignments uh, that we did in the video series. Uh, remember, there were two assignments all together. And you can pause the video and tab back if you look after you look at the lesson. Search for systematic theology when you get to that link. And you'll see a very short and concise PDF called Theology Definitions in which to open. Recall that Restoration Movement cults twist Bible definitions to make room for their work salvation scheme. It's important to unlearn their propaganda in order to start anew and be made whole. So it's not just enough to leave the group because then, you know, you got to fill your, your house up with good things, with the gospel, with grace, and with good teaching. An empty house will just come back and be occupied by some other kind of strong man. So fill your life up. Really, really, really start being a Bible student and go to a church, a grace-filled church, a safe haven church, evangelical or Protestant leaning. Okay, orthodox approach to reading the Bible. Again, this is positive. These are the solution here. How to read the Bible for all it's worth. Gordon Fee, Douglas Stewart. I love the line in that book that says, a passage could never mean what it could never have meant to the people at that time. But that is a great book. I've read it and it is a keeper amongst keepers. Everyone that I know of, except for the restoration movement and the cults, of course, love that book. It's highly respected. How to Read the Bible in Changing Times, Understanding and Applying God's Word Today by Dr. Mark L. Strauss, a great book, and he's got um, a whole way of going through interlocking um, criteria and overarching themes when dealing with a passage. Orthodox approach to reading the Bible, replacing the lie of CEI with good stuff. So bullets top to bottom, avoid how-to books coming from restoration authors and publishers, especially the Church of Christ One run websites. Oh gosh, they're awful. Stick to widely acclaimed evangelical Protestant leading authors and theologians. If you like Dr. Stanley, go with him. There are so many others. I've read both of these books and have found a wide array of other Christians, including myself, that were helped by them. I didn't read all of Mark Strauss's book, but uh, the most important part that I felt. Anyhow, I've heard good things about Dr. Charles Stanley, like I said in his book on hermeneutics as well. Ding, ding, ding. This is really important. Again, think of that tree, those, the rotten tree and the good tree. Most of the error within the church today always comes back to hermeneutics, applied rules of Bible interpretation. It also stems from a sinful heart and my way religion. So in addition to these books, I strongly re recommend giving, getting an NIV study Bible with commentary at the bottom of each chapter. The new NIV comes out later this year. Now this is really great. Dr. Mark Strauss, that book down there, How to Read the Bible in Changing Times, 
Well, he's the vice chair of the NIV committee on Bible translation. He is respected all over the world for his scholarly work. He's also a teacher of over 25 years at Bethel Seminary, and he teaches at the church my wife and I attend, the church at Rancho Bernardo here in San Diego. I have been blessed to be in his class for over a year now, and I also recommend Bible.org as a good and reliable source of scholarly commentary. Um, I also like DesiringGod.org and the Gospel Coalition. GotQuestions.org is excellent. I also recommend my own website and the articles posted on it, on it, which I've read. My wife has read and we've approved. That's www.sparrowministry.com. Okay. Uh, Dale Ratcliffe, uh, Ratcliffe uh, Adventist. Um, he knows quite a bit about that group and I think it's Colleen Tinker and Proclamation Magazine. Wonderful human being. Colleen and her husband, the Tinkers, really, really good at refuting and helping people coming out of Adventism. And Dale Ratzliff is a really good too. Anyhow, do not, this is a kind of a very stern, important statement. Do not journey into the realm of the cults unarmed. The word is our sword and shield. And it is my sincere prayer that God will increase your faith to trust in his grace and provision to draw you closer to God. It is not easy when you realize the church you love has sold you a bogus bill of goods. That is no fun to realize that. God specializes, however, in making us whole, making us new, and making us strong through his grace and strengthened by understanding his word. That's it. That's it, guys, on the topic of American cult Christianity, part two, 22, and the fifth soul of the Reformation, sola scriptura, or scriptures alone, scripture alone. And I'll do part two of two next. Thank you for viewing, and be sure to check out my website and ebook series on the International Church of Christ at www.sparrowministry.com, or order the books directly from amazon.com or my amazon.com author page. Series is applicable to anyone coming out of a Bible-based cult, Church of Christ or Adventism, UPCI. They are also available on Apple Books, Barnes & Noble, Walmart, and Rakuten. And if you don't have a Kindle device, no problem. The website has other formats that will work on your PC, Chromebook, smartphone, and tablet.